Good afternoon and welcome to the Environmental Governance Labs webinar, Has the Pandemic Disrupted Carbon Lock-In? I'm Matt Hoffman, one of the co-directors of the Environmental Governance Lab here at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. We've got a great event planned for this afternoon and we're glad to see so many colleagues and friends joining us for today. First, I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement as we, as we often do and as I think is so important. And the land acknowledgement's important for this event of course, to acknowledge the specific peoples on whose traditional land we're meeting today, especially the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today's event is especially an opportunity to reflect on what the land acknowledgement means though, I think. Carbon lock-in, the fossil energy dependent world we have built and that now threatens so many of us, is an issue that connects deeply to the settler indigenous people's relationship and our collective relationship and responsibility to this land and future generations. Indigenous people face some of the most significant threats from fossil energy extraction practices, as well as climate impacts. And many indigenous peoples are also at the forefront of efforts and activism to address them. I'm grateful for our opportunity to work on this land today at this event, and it is an, an opportunity to think deeply about what it, what it takes to improve the sustainability of our world. Before I turn things over to our outstanding panelists, here's how the webinar is gonna to work today. First, I'm gonna provide some brief context before turning over to our panelists. They're gonna provide comments for about 10 minutes each. We'll then have a moderated discussion amongst the panelists followed by Q&A with you all. You can use the Q&A function to ask any questions that come to mind and, and also remember that you don't have to wait for the Q&A to start, to start asking your questions. You can put them in the Q&A anytime that they, the Q&A function on Zoom, anytime that they occur to you. So today's webinar is the first in a three-part series that the Environmental Governance Lab has planned for this fall, leading up to our EGL symposium coming up next spring, Pursuing Decarbonization in Hard Times. And at the outset, I would like to thank Alan Dean and his family, as well as the Brookfield Partners Foundation for gen generously supporting the EGL Symposium. The Symposium is going to be exploring if and how climate action and momentum for decarbonization can be sustained and accelerated even as the world faces overlapping health and economic crises. And that momentum has to be sustained. The pandemic has laid bare and is laying bare in terrifying and devastating detail the fragility, inequality, and in many cases injustice of normal. Going back to normal is simply not a viable option. Just transition, decarbonization, improving equity, justice, pursuing anti-racism are really only the viable pathways forward for our societies. The COVID crisis, both health and economic, occurring in the midst of the climate crisis makes this clearer than ever and attempts to go back to normal are not run of the mill policy mistakes, they're existential threats. That's not to say that moves towards decarbonization and just transition are inevitable. They aren't. Our symposium next spring is gonna explore what's being done and what needs to be done to accelerate momentum towards decarbonization and just transition, even in these challenging times. Our lead up webinar series this fall is gonna explore foundational questions that's gonna inform the symposium discussions next spring. So today we're asking, has the pandemic disrupted carbon lock-in? Our second webinar on October 21st is going to look at where decarbonization is in pandemic recovery plans, especially in Canada. And will we avoid the failure to transition that we experienced after the 2008-2009 financial crisis? And then on November 18, we'll ask, what does a just transition in a time of pandemic actually look like? But today we're gonna to explore the pandemic and carbon lock-in. Now carbon lock-in is a major stumbling block to the kind of transition we need. And it's the notion that our societies suffer from what Gregory Unruh has done, deemed carbon lock-in. Political, social, economic, and technological forces are all reinforcing the use of fossil energy as the natural and really the only way to run society from our economic systems to our transportation and energy systems, 
to our buildings, to our agriculture. And this lock-in works from the household level all the way through to the global level. The city of Toronto is locked into the use of fossil energy because of how it's physically planned, the practices of its citizens around transportation and energy use, the political coalitions and institutional capacities that make cities run politically, and the range of technological options available to city dwellers. Likewise, Canada is locked into the use of fossil fuels at the national level because of similar, though, though not identical, cultural, economic, political, and technological dynamics on a larger scale. National energy and transportation policy, national economic conditions, national culture and geography. Further, the lock-in at different levels reinforces each other or it's interdependent. Lock-in in cities reinforces national lock-in. Global lock-in reinforces national lock-in and it goes both ways. Now disrupting this dependence, this natural way that fossil energy defines our societies to the point that we usually don't even think about it, is hard, right? It's a major reason that we have had too little transformation over the last 30 years, even while the scientific certainty and public urgency around climate change has steadily increased. Now has the pandemic disrupted this dependence? And has it done so in a lasting way? Could it? Exploring these questions is our task for today. When the pandemic was in its first stages, there were a number of hopeful stories about the environmental silver lining, the benefits, albeit tragically achieved, of economic shutdown. There were stories about clean skies and bicycles replacing cars. People openly wondered if this would help with climate change and COVID did indeed reduce emissions to some degree for a while. Was it a lasting disruption though? And what would it take to make it so? So today we have three outstanding panelists to help us think through these very questions and this difficult topic. I'm gonna introduce all three and then they're gonna give us some reflections on these before we have a, a broader discussion. So first we have Piers Forster. Piers is an atmospheric physicist at the University of Leeds and the founding director of the Priestley International Center for Climate. He's an expert on climate modeling and climate risk in addition to his research career, Piers established the Forest Protection and Research Charity, the United Bank of Carbon, and has a number of roles advising industry and government, including membership of the Rolls-Royce Environment Advisory Board and the UK Committee on Climate Change. He's also a coordinating lead author for the upcoming IPCC 6 Assessment Report. In August, he was the lead author on the Nature Climate Change article, Current and Future Global Climate Impacts Resulting from COVID-19. Our second panelist is Samantha Gross. Samantha is the Director of the Energy Security and Climate Initiative at the Brookings Institute. Her work is focused on the intersection of energy, environment, and policy, including climate policy and international cooperation, energy efficiency, unconventional oil and gas development, regional, regional and global natural gas trade, and the energy water nexus. Among a number of diverse roles and activities in climate policy, Samantha was the Director of the Office of International Climate and Clean Energy at the U.S. Department of Energy, where she directed U.S. activities under the Clean Energy Ministerial, including initiatives focused on clean energy implementation and access and energy efficiency. And our third panelist is Jonas Nam. Jonas is Assistant Professor of Energy Resources and Environment at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. His research interests focus on the intersection of economic and industrial policy, energy policy, and environmental politics. In particular, he studies the role of the state in processes of industrial restructuring that accompany responses to climate change and the clean energy transitions more broadly. Right now, he is working on a project tracking the greenhouse gas emission implications of pandemic recovery plans. All right, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Piers and I'm gonna remind everyone to please, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A whenever they come up and uh, we will have a nice discussion at the end of the presentations. So Piers, the floor is yours. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. It's excellent to be here today. I will just load my PowerPoint, if you hold on for a sec. Yes, so you can all 
can hopefully have a look at my PowerPoint. Um, so I'm an atmospheric This is my background, so I'm not at all expert on the political aspect, but I, I guess gradually over my career, I have have to become more political. And I am currently the director of an interdisciplinary research center where we try and look interdisciplinary at different climate solutions. Um, so, so I thought I would begin today after that excellent introduction with just giving you my opinion at the be beginning that I do think the pandemic really has set us onto a different kind of trajectory. And I want to very quickly explain kind of, kind of five reasons why. If I get this to work, yeah, okay. And I wanted to indicate with this, with my first kind of PowerPoint slide, s some of the work from the publication that Matt referred to. So, the, the, so with this analysis, we looked at Google Mobility data, and we calculated the reductions in different emissions from COVID-19. And this diagram brings it up to today or not very far from today. Uh, and what I wanted to get from the diagram, we, we did have the really big reduction in April, uh, but I want to look at the recovery from that. From that. Uh, and if you have a look, we certainly haven't yet got back to where we were and we're still about 14 percent below, below where we were in 2019 and this is an average of 125 different countries uh, and the most ex exciting thing about this diagram from the perspective of today is, is, is that this reduction in emissions um, um, is much bigger than the reduction in either economic activity or and the reduction in energy supply. So if you look at data from the IEA, which I show you on the left hand side of this PowerPoint, you, you can see that this change has really come from big reductions in the use of oil and coal and gas. And we even fact had an, in, an increase in renewable energy over the same time. And the other very exciting thing about this can work we did was that this the the big changes and shifts of energy didn't just occur in the developed countries and you they occurred in India and they occurred in China and they occurred in every single country we examined we, have, we, we looked at 125 different countries and they all did the same choice they all particularly chose to shut down their coal and to really to really rely more on their renewables and i found that very exciting uh, and this was referred to in that mm, 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 excellent introduction, but I think he was rather pessimistic there, and uh, and I think we're not necessarily going to return exactly to where we were before with these behavioural choices we have observed, particularly with talking over the internet like we are currently, and and more people choosing to work from 
home for more of the time. So, so, so I, I think that really tells us that society can change, and I think some of the some of the changes will begin to be more kind of permanent. Uh, um, the the big thing that comes up when I talk to people about this this generally is that the expense of the pandemic have been enormous and it will be too expensive but but the kind of the whole cost of this net zero trans system we estimate to keep temperatures to well below two degrees and get the net zero kind of targets they are definitely all the kind of calculation indicate they come out at about kind of one percent of GDP would be a very expensive transition, uh, and uh, quite a lot of them are very economical, and they actually are economically advisable. Uh, and as well as this, of course, the other thing that we need to do: we don't only need to invest in the renewable technologies; we need to invest in some of the fossil fuel work. But they're not who can cost to do, uh, and they're not can the taxpayer have to can, can pay this economic cost? Most of the costs will come from private investments. And I just show you one example to two different prices of different <laughs> stops on the bottom of the PowerPoint. The Orsted is a very big renewable predominantly can, can, can power company based in and Mark and kind of BP is still slightly dependent on oil uh, and you can you can definitely see there how their stock prices have developed over the last 12 months and, and you can see now if you were a kind of, kind of pension fund which of these companies would you prefer to be in? Uh, um, and I think the other thing that I see is definitely transformed and changed is the will of the general public. We've just had in the UK, we run a climate assembly where we took a good cross section demographic of people from you, 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 we took them through a program and discussion, and then they came up with their recommendations for what to do about climate change. And, and they all pretty unanimously thought it was a good idea to do this, this sort of work, and they all were prepared to make individual change to get to that particular transition. The other thing they talked about was that, um, oh yeah, I won't get that yet. And the other thing that changed is I think industry are definitely on board with the changes. Just in the middle of the pandemic, when the airline industry are all going kind of bankrupt, a big company, Airbus, just came out. Yesterday, the, the, the telling us they want to invest billions into building a zero carbon commercial aircraft. Sorry, not by 2025, by 20. Con 35, but that is still a very ambitious kind of target. So I do think industry is up for this transition. Uh, and I would just, I think before I get on to my fifth point, I would just mention two obstacles. The first is Matt talked about in the introduction in this idea of just transition 
it's obviously a very important thing to cons consider. And if you do look historically, we've been really kind of terrible at achieving it. There aren't very many ex examples across society where it has occurred. And the, the other thing, the, the biggest obstacle that we've very much brought out in the climate assembly document is that there's this huge death education and we're not going to training people to be in the right jobs and we're not giving people the required educational background to try and get these jobs and to try and make this change. Um, but I'm going to end by being optimistic. I think when, it, when we eventually look back on the pandemic, I think we will rem remember the time when we could hear the singing of the kind of, kind of birds. And I think we will also rem rem remember just after kind of well, 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 important thing that we can really only solve problems if we effectively cooperate across all the world countries. So, so, so I think that will be the ultimate legacy of the pandemic. So I'm quite kind of confident we can get off this fossil intensive pathway. Excellent. Thank you so much, Piers. Um, Samantha, on to you. Thank you very much. It's interesting. I, I come in with a slightly different point of view and a little more qualitative point of view, although I think that Piers and I agree on many of the underlying points, but the, the thing that I want to bring in and talk a little bit about is about the behavior of people and also the behavior of politicians. So the question that was raised to me, has the pandemic interrupted carbon lock-in? And in a word, not yet. Although the jury's not in on this yet. There are still things that we can do and should be doing to help this along. Um, but just saying not yet doesn't make much of a presentation. So what I want to do is focus on what has changed as the pandemic has happened over these past few months, um, what hasn't changed, and then what might be different going forward, and things that we could think about both in our own behavior to encourage decarbonization at the same time as we're dealing with the pandemic and as this, at the same time as um, we're dealing with certainly some, some political things happening in the United States where I live. So let's start talking about things that really changed during the height of the pandemic. And the most important one was in the transportation sector. When you have a pandemic, when you tell people to stay home, um, transportation just went through the floor. People were staying at home, they were not commuting to work. They were not um, flying for meetings or flying internationally or for, or for leisure. People were very much staying put and that had a tremendous impact on, on demand for transportation, in turn demand for transportation fuel, primarily derived from oil. There was even a couple of days, and I, I spent a lot of time on the phone commenting on various things for these couple of days, where the benchmark oil price in the United States went below zero. Um, and there are some technical reasons why, but that really tells you just how much demand plummeted for oil during that time. Um, it's also true that industrial activity saw cutbacks um, just because of the overall economic slowdown that happened when the economy in the United States and in various other places of, around the world just shut down to try to rein in the, the spread of COVID-19 and to rein in the pandemic. Um, Peers showed that 
CO2 emissions globally are still down 14%. And I think part of what that tells us is the economy has not fully recovered. I know the jobs number is best for the United States and we're still down millions of jobs. There are millions of people who are out of work in the United States because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Granted, our pandemic has been worse than in some other places for reasons that are the topic of a whole nother discussion. But um, it's important to know that, that these emissions reductions happened because of a slowdown in economic activity. Um, and I had a lot of discussions as this was coming. Matt talked about in, this his in, in his introduction. Emissions are down. We have blue skies and clean water. Is this a preview of coming attractions? And one would hope so. But we have to think about how we got there. And we got there in a way where we drastically cut economic activity in a way that was very painful to a number of people. And so we want to see a lower cut carbon economy, we want to see the kind of deep decarbonization we need to have to reduce the worst effects of climate change, but we don't want to do it in a way that is so painful for so many people. And particularly if you want to think about a just transition, this was a very unjust transition. It hurt the people at the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder the most. Um, those who don't have white collar jobs who can just take their computer and work at home. Um, they either were out of work or were out being exposed to the pandemic. So this is not the way we want to reduce CO2 emissions. Something else that is a change as a result of the pandemic is investment patterns. Certainly at the beginning of the pandemic, we saw reduced investment and greatly reduced consumption and thus production of oil and gas. And that's good for immediate greenhouse gas emissions. But also in this climate of real economic uncertainty, you see plunges in all kinds of investment. And that includes investment in green energy. If we're not sure about the future of electricity demand, if the economy is in the hole and we're not sure how long it's going to take to recover, that damages investments in general and can somewhat derail the investment climate for green energies as well as for fossil energies. And so we need to think about that. It's also true that long-term thinking is really difficult when you're dealing with a short-term crisis. It's just human nature. What you have to do is fix the problem. We need, people need to stop dying, frankly, right now. And so it makes the kind of long-term planning that dealing with problems like climate requires a bit more difficult. However, we're seeing governments try. Um, I think one of the best examples is the European Green Deal and that they're going forward with that despite the COVID pandemic and they're thinking about how to use investments under the European Green Deal as stimulus, how to put people back to work, how to keep the economy running while also making investments that lead us towards deeper decarbonization. Um, I'm actually going to be in Europe next um, winter, next fall and winter, discuss, studying that and understanding how that's working. So I'm looking forward to it. But I think that's a sign of how to do things right. Um, you see the Biden campaign in the United States, where I live, also focused on that. But I'll also point out that these can be politically difficult in a crisis. When people are out of work, they're like, why are you, why are you worried about greening the economy when I need a job? Why are you worrying about greening the economy when my relatives are dying? And so we need to think about how to pitch that politically, not just in the United States environment, but I think it's true in others as well. Um, it, this, this can be a difficult thing to pitch politically. And we have to point out that yes, we're incurring costs, but the benefits are likely to be much greater. And society's impression about what this costs and benefits are, are at least in the political scale, probably more important than the actual costs and benefits. And we need to find a way to bring societal impressions of the costs and benefits closer to what scientists understand as those costs and benefits. And I think the immediate crisis of COVID may, may actually make that challenge a little bit more difficult. Um, Let's talk about something that's not changed as a result of the, COVID and of the COVID pandemic and change gears a little bit. And something that hasn't changed a bit is the underlying energy system. We have the exact same energy system here in September of 2020 that we did in January of 2020 before the COVID pandemic hit. Um, 
there's nothing about the pandemic that pushed electrification of vehicles or of other processes that changed the carbon intensity of various industries. What we saw was a general slowdown. What we didn't see was a systemic change in what types of energy we're using and how they're used. And if those underlying systems don't change, we'll see what happened in after the economic crisis of 2008 is we'll go right back to where we started. We don't want that. That's not the outcome we're looking for. And that goes back to thinking about how to use stimulus funds to put people back to work to change those underlying systems. But the pandemic itself didn't change those systems. And if we don't do it, do it on purpose, that won't happen. And so we need to think policy wise and connect that, change those systems, make a greener economy and connect that with economic recovery to solve this politically. And so the, my last category of things to talk about is maybes. And this is something that Pierce brought, brought up as well and I'm in totally agreement with him is we've seen some behavioral changes that could be really helpful if they stick. We have seen people um, teleworking. I'm actually teleworking from my home in Mexico right now. I'm coming to all you. I didn't fly to Toronto for this event. You know, I'm running a few electrons to speak to you all, and that's fantastic. Um, people aren't commuting to work, they're working from home. They're not doing all this flying to have meetings. Um, we have realized that this system, well, it doesn't completely take the place of face-to-face -face conversation. We could do a lot more with this than we thought we could. And this system has forced us all to realize that, and that's a good thing. Um, how much that sticks around remains to be seen. I think it'll be different in different industries. Um, I don't think we're all gonna continue to work this way full time. I think we've realized how much we can do this way and also realized some of the limitations and that having a meal or a drink with a person is in some ways irreplaceable. But I think people flying in to talk for an hour at an event like this, we may see a lot less of that in the future because this works by and large. Another thing I'm worried about though is kind of the flip side of the changes in transportation. And that is we're seeing this fear of public transport right now that really worries me. Um, I, when I've been back in Washington, I haven't been on the Metro since February. Um, whereas I am typically a daily Metro writer. Um, and I worry about that going forward with people becoming afraid of these modes of public transport that are actually much better ways to get around and moving towards individual modes, um, driving themselves to work alone rather than getting on a bus or a subway train. And so that's something that could become more problematic. Um, perhaps if mask wearing becomes if we understand that mask wearing works and if we convince the public of that, perhaps they'll be willing to go back to public transit. But we need to make sure that we keep the good changes and um, don't keep some of these bad changes or sources of fear that could actually damage more efficient forms of transportation. So that's something I think we can work with it, but it's something that public health folks need to think about and energy folks need to think about and think about how to, to keep the good parts of the transportation and, um, and not the bad parts. So I think I'll leave it there. I think there's the possibility that this could, um, could pull us back on carbon lock-in and could move us towards a greener economy. But um, we need to think about it on purpose because the emissions that we've seen already aren't gonna stick around if we don't make those changes on purpose. All right, thank you so much, Samantha. And uh, in fact, I think that's a great segue to, to Jonas who's gonna talk a little bit about what we're doing on purpose. So, Jonas, on to you. All right. So, um, those were very optimistic presentations. So, I think Matt put me last to really uh, offer a very pessimistic perspective. So, I'm going to give you three reasons why I think we're not disrupting anything at the moment. Um, and uh, why we're sort of missing the current opportunity as, he, as, 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 you know, as long as I could, as far as I can see right now. So what I'm going to talk about is just really briefly about the emissions reductions, which I think are much smaller than is often reported in the media if you sort of put them in the broader context. Um, I'll quickly report some uh, very preliminary data from this project that we're uh, doing at Hopkins, where we're basically looking at stimulus packages in G20 economies to try to understand um, how much money has been spent on sort of emissions increasing versus emissions increasing activities. 
and then I'll quickly talk about uh, sort of disrupting um, disrupting carbon versus disrupting globalization, which are sort of two different things. And so, you know, if we think about past recessions, we've basically always recovered back to um, sort of pre-recession emissions levels and in the recovery often surpassed them through investments in construction and infrastructure, for instance, cement is a huge contributor. And so if the current um, sort of, you know, emissions reductions are projected to be about 5% for this year globally, maybe a little bit more, I mean, this whole thing seems to be dragging on much longer than expected. Um, the impact on sort of cumulative emissions in the atmosphere that are really shaping climate change is negligible, right? So this is that these two blocks are basically showing you a 5% reduction and you can see it's basically not really much. Um, so the stuff that's in the atmosphere and making the climate warmer um, is, is basically just as much. So if we go back to the previous sort of levels and surpass them, this one year of reduced economic activity really didn't buy us any time. And then the second sort of cause for pessimism is really that I think the green stimulus is likely going to be small. There was a lot of conversations and they still are about how we can stimulate um, economic growth and use that to also really disrupt um, carbon in the economy and shift us onto a more sustainable path. Um, I think especially in Europe, there were sort of a lot of early attempts and there are policies coming out of many countries looking at this. But I think there's also the temptation to fund um, construction, for instance, in the, in the recovery, as we've done in 2009, uh, when we spent about 15% uh, in G20 economies on kind of green stimulus measures. Um, and that didn't, um, that didn't really sort of shift the trajectory. Uh, in China right now, uh, shelf power plants are sort of, you know, coming back online or, or sort of shelf construction projects are giving, getting permits. Um, we have a lot of fossil fuel industries elsewhere that are asking for, for, for exemptions, basically regulatory exemptions, bailouts, and so on. A lot of countries sort of first jumped to bail out their national oil companies as this hit. And so, um, there is a temptation to not just fund green stuff and shift this transition um, or shift the economy on a more sustainable path, but also the temptation to really, you know, essentially take care of existing fossil fuel interests. So what we've done at Hopkins since March is to basically go through every stimulus bill uh, that was passed since the beginning of the recession uh, in G20 economies and in the European Union. And we've added up how much of it is sort of spent on kind of green activities versus um, sort of you know fossil fuel compensation. It's a pretty rough um, you know rough data set right now. One of the difficulties is sort of trying to disentangle how, what is recession specific and what are bills that were going to be passed anyway. Um, and we're currently working with the team of engineers at Hopkins that's going to model out what the actual emissions impact of this is going to be. Right now, as of late August, um, early September 2020, we have basically spent the exact same amount on green and uh, fossil fuel uh, supporting activities. It's about 7% on each. And if you compare that to the 15 or 16% on green stuff in 2009, we're not just um, missing the boat here, we're sort of falling short by a lot. This is less than half of what we spent and we're 10 years further into the climate problem um, California is on fire, there are hurricanes in the Gulf, and still um, we're not really ri rising to the challenge. If you break this down by country, there's places like India and Russia that are spending 80% of their stimulus money on fossil fuels. Um, China is at about 40 right now if you take out sort of large infrastructure projects that were basically approved before um, before the um, the recession. And so really the European Union, um, Korea stands out here a little bit, but this isn't a, this isn't a hopeful breakdown to me. And it's kind of shocking to see how much of, uh, of kind of fiscal stimulus, this doesn't include loans or loan guarantees or anything like that, um, how much of fiscal stimulus is basically going to sort of neutral activities, right? Things that don't really help us move the needle in one way um, or the other. And so that's sort of my second cause for pessimism. This doesn't look like disruption to me. And then the third, and I just want to talk about this briefly so we have time for discussion. You know, I've said this many times before the, um, before the recession, but it's sort of becoming more difficult now. Globalization is really important for all of these new industries that basically are thriving on global supply chains. So renewables, batteries, electric vehicles, they have global supply chains. And the 
COVID pandemic and the sort of geopolitics surrounding China and the US response are really disrupting uh, globalization. And that is disruptive for the industries that we need uh, to fix this problem. You know, I live in the US where there's sort of especially strong kind of anti-China um, uh, policies at the moment and sort of the attempt to kind of shift manufacturing back to the US through trade barriers and so on. But the reality is right now that China basically makes everything that we need in the short term to fix this problem. And so it makes, you know, two thirds of the world's solar panels, a third of the world's wind turbines. It's the largest market and supplier of electric vehicles. It makes two thirds of the lithium iron batteries that we need um, for storage and for electric vehicles. And so all of that manufacturing capacity is in China. And my worry is, and I can't confirm that with data yet, that if we had a kind of green stimulus, we would try to shift these supply chains and try to get stuff that was made locally. Already people are talking about, you know, why aren't we making electric vehicles in Canada? Why aren't we making more batteries in Europe? And that's, a, you know, a great idea. I think we should all benefit from the jobs that come out of these industries. The problem is for us in the rest of the world to build out this kind of manufacturing capacity is going to cost us a lot of time. And that's not time we currently have to try to fix this problem. We've had these incredible cost declines as a result of manufacturing capacity. This is just showing sort of the last 10 years in wind and solar where costs have come down rapidly. We're seeing similar patterns now for electric vehicles. And so um, if we give up or, or try to sort of, you know, not utilize China's uh, contribution to these industries, we are basically losing a lot of these cost advantages in the scale economies and we're losing time. It's going to be more expensive for the rest of us and we won't be deploying these technologies so quickly. And so I think there's sort of three lessons here uh, for why I'm pessimistic about this as an opportunity for us to really shift behavior. I think one is really that these current emissions reductions have demonstrated to us the scale of the challenge. We've locked down basically most of the economic activity in the world for a really long time that required travel and, and, and sort of getting together. And still it's sort of a negligible impact. I also worry that the painfulness that Samantha um, referenced might associate climate policy going forward with sort of economic suffering. And I think that's gonna be really hard for the politics around it. Um, the second lesson is that a green stimulus is a huge opportunity to do something, but I don't think it'll get us around the politics. And if you look at the breakdown so far in these preliminary figures, the fossil fuel interests are mobilized and they're ready to go and they're getting what they want in many parts of the world. The third lesson really is that if we have any hope of preventing the worst consequences of climate change, we need to figure out a way to work with China and we need to figure out a way to work with China right now in disrupting this. And I'm, you know, I'm happy to talk in the Q&A about all the sort of uh, you know, climate um, exacerbating activities that are taking place in China too. It's no climate angel, but we somehow need to figure out a way to, to sort of utilize all of the capabilities we have in the world. And currently a lot of the manufacturing is happening in China. So I think we really need to sort of politically think about this in terms of two ways. In the short term, um, I'm hoping that we can get stimulus bills in more parts of the world more aggressively and with more funding that invest in things that create jobs right now and disregard where the, the products that we're deploying are being manufactured. And so this is building efficiency, renewable energy, investments in you know, sustainable transit and other infrastructure projects. All of that creates jobs locally um, and it doesn't really matter whether the panel that I'm installing is made in China or elsewhere. And so I'm hoping we don't get this new nationalism um, in these bills. In the long term, I hope that China's competitiveness in these industries gets the rest of us to do something about it rather than to sort of blame China for taking over these industries. And so that means investing in national competitiveness around the world. I think the European Union is trying to do that, the sort of next generation Europe attempt um, to focus on research and development, on building the European battery industry, on trying to figure out how to decarbonize heavy industry with hydrogen. That's a climate policy, but it's primarily a policy to be competitiveness as, competitive as a continent in sort of the next generation of industries. And we can do that while we also buy things from China or elsewhere in the short term. And so those are sort of the two big pathways that I see uh, that are important for us, but the, we need to really disentangle, I think, in terms of um, the importance right now. So, you know, and paying people to retrofit buildings, for instance, would create jobs immediately. 
um, and, and be very useful, it would disrupt the kind of pathways that we're on. Um, I'm just sort of worried that in the current situation, we're not doing enough of that and we're spending too much time playing geopolitics and talking about what other places are doing or shouldn't be doing. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna um, stop. Thank you so much. You're right, Jonas, I should have had you go first. <laughs> <laughs> a dose of uh, a dose of pessimism to uh, to to end the panel there. Although I think that what's what's interesting to me about the all three panelists is you you all sort of laid out how we've started to turn off the taps in some way of of the emissions, but we haven't sort of dismantled the underlying infrastructure that has generated the the flow of emissions into the into the atmosphere although there are some aspects and all three of you brought out some aspects where sort of changing that underlying infrastructure starts to become possible and before i ask some questions to to get maybe the the panelists speaking to one another a little bit i just want to remind everybody uh, that if you have questions um, go ahead and put them in the in the Q and A function. I've I've started to see a few of them already, which is great. Um, but go ahead and if you if you were sparked by anything the panelists said, go ahead and put those in the in the Q and A. So first, I want to ask, and I guess this could be for all three folks, and and maybe you'll talk to each other about this. So. Piers, your work saw reduction in emissions that outstripped the economic downturn and, and in some ways even outstripped the reduction in energy use. And I wonder if that is the start of, and this is and it's for all three of you, is this a sign of a start of the shift in the underlying system because of behavioral change, because of finance? Or is this an, a, an artifact of um, that the behavioral shifts were just, were, were different in a way. In other words, do, does this, the fact that the emissions reductions went lower than we would have thought just from the economic downturn and just from the energy use, what, what does that indicate? Does that indicate that there has been, that this behavioral shifts that, that Samantha was talking about have, have started to have an impact? Is it an indication that some of the financial flows that are, that are moving have some possibility for broader and lasting change? Or to go back to what Jonas was talking about, that this is more fleeting, shall we say? Well, perhaps I can begin and then the others can tell me. I'm really interested in what, John, Johannes, I, I really don't know kind of what to what what to kind of call you in fact anyway. Could you call kind of John on your computer anyway? So what I think you see in India, you see them deliberately turning off the coal, and that is because of the air quality implications. Um, and in countries like most EU countries, they have financial incentives within the energy supply industry to try and do more renewables. So I think it is due to a combination of environmental kind of, kind of policies that the government decided to turn off their more fossil fuel intensive supplies. So kind of that was why I was optimistic. Uh, Piers answered the question that I was going to ask, and that was because I don't have the data in front of me, but if I did, I would dig in and look to see if the changes that we saw because of the pandemic were in particularly intensive uses. Um, you talk about shutting down coal in India, and I think that's happened in other places too, because renewables with their zero marginal cost of production are, are the cheapest, and you're going to keep those running no matter what, even when your power demand goes down. 
Um, aviation is another particularly energy intensive industry that just absolutely crashed during the pandemic. And so I think be, for, for various reasons, the, the uses that we saw decline were particularly intensive uses. Um, but I think that was, I don't want to say luck. I mean, there were structural reasons why this happened, but I don't think those are necessarily permanent as the economy recovers. And that's where my little bit of pessimism comes in. So maybe I would, I'll be, speak out of character and give a sort of optimistic response now to this question. Um, I think that there's sort of a couple different things here. One, it's really shown us how many, and I think this came up during all the presentations, the sort of lockdowns have shown us what we can do without, you know, burning fuel to get to other places. And I think some of those um, patterns are going to stick. Um, we've now for the first time tried to do 5,000 people conferences online and it's not great, but it's, you know, also a lot more affordable, a lot more inclusive and accessible ideally. And so I think some of these examples um, were sort of born out of this situation that we would have never tried otherwise. And I can see some lasting changes there. I also think that um, we've seen some sort of immediate environmental benefits from the lockdowns that have nothing really to do with climate, but sort of improvements in urban air quality, people are finally being able to see the mountains in Los Angeles. And so, you know, this sort of um, immediate environmental impression, I think, might be helpful for motivating people to do more on climate because there are lots of non-climate environmental benefits that we get when we have good climate policy. And so, you know, that those are sort of more immediately felt and I'm hoping that we can use that politically to motivate people to say, look, like you may not care so much about climate because it's too abstract for you, but remember that time you could see the Rocky Mountains. And so that sort of stuff I think could also really help. And, and um, you know, those may not necessarily things that stick, but that might be useful as we come up with, you know, policies and instruments that will stick um, past, the, past the sort of economic recession that we're in. Sort of building on that, Jonas, I, I think this is a point that all three of you sort of have, have made in some ways. One of the things that really interests me about whether the pandemic is, is going to be disruptive is, is that the, the sort of one of the most challenging aspects of carbon lock-in is how invisible it usually is. We don't think about it. We just, it is part of the structure of our day. It is part of what is natural about how we've structured our societies and energy systems and transportation systems. And one way to disrupt that is to make things visible, to make it, make what was not obvious, obvious. And I think that the pandemic has made a couple of things obvious that auger towards making the transition more likely or, or disrupting carbon lock-in at least possible. One, it has made inequality of, a, of the fossil dominated system incredibly obvious, as I think it was Samantha that mentioned that, yes, the, the, the lockdown was, uh, was a huge economic downturn, but it certainly was not an equal one. We were all in this together, but we were all in this together in very different ways and ways that were um, harmful to, to many people. Um, especially people of color, especially people in socioeconomically disadvantaged communities. Um, and so I'm, and, and that has a, has a clear parallel with climate impacts, right? The iron law of climate change is that those that are least responsible for causing it face the, the most uh, serious consequences. And so the, the pandemic has made this visible in important ways. And it's also, as, as you all also talked about it, it made the, the necessity or non-necessity of some aspects of the fossil system visible. Does this have a, is, is this a, is this a means of disruption? What do we think? I guess I'll start out for a minute. I do think that the way that the pandemic has shown a light on inequality in general and and environmentally related inequality, more specifically, has to help. I don't think that environmental inequality is something that most people think about much. They think about air quality as being air quality, and not necessarily that the way we site facilities, highways, you know, polluting objects, um, is typically in minority communities. We just don't think about that, and because that's because many of us don't see them. For many of us, 
you know, if you don't work in, in energy, your electricity comes from the wall. You don't think about where that power come from and who might have been harmed in its production. And I hope that just the idea that, that this pandemic has really shown a light on inequality. I mean, just the death rates in the United States, at least where I know the data the best, are incredibly disproportionate. And there's also been studies showing that air pollution makes death rates from makes death rates and deaths of, and um, disease rates from COVID-19 worse, which totally makes sense. But we need to think about that. And I'm hoping that the pandemic will shine a light on that and will bring new communities into concern about air pollution issues and climate issues and bring those who care about equality a little more to the table in a way that's helpful. I would certainly agree. Uh, and, and the other thing I was I was say, I think, when we can finally out the other end, I, I think we all want to have a more resilient society. And I think people will want to be more organized and the just transition thing will come into play with that. And that's why I also talked about the international institutions. And I think we will want to make sure they're really kind of robust. So, so, so so, so I think ultim, ultim, ultimately, just to just to amount of was discussing. I, I think when we reflect, we with the time with the kind of reflected time, we will think far more about the sort of society we want to create. So, so I I think it really kind of has given us the opportunity because we were going down one particular one particular pathway and I think if you look at the time of change if you look at the times historically when society has really transformed it has been at times of great disaster so Yes, yeah, so, so I just think there's a little bit of opportunity there. Um, if I, I think it also has though, it's sort of like, it's shown us the inequality, but it's also shown us sort of, you know, the inequality has shown us the problems with the existing system that go beyond climate, right? And so you've seen sort of, you know, wealthy people making a lot more money during the pandemic, um, you know, hiding out in their second homes, flying to Jackson Hole with ventilators in the early stages of the lockdown. I mean, it's sort of shown us through the sort of health response to the pandemic, how unequal opportunities are. And we have a similar dynamic in climate change where people can have second homes in places that are less affected. They can have generators, they can build their own energy supply and sort of the solidarity aspect of a transition I think was always at risk even before because some people just have different means and you know a lot of these a lot of these impacts um, can be responded to differently depending on how much money you have. Um, how this now works out is really dependent on whether we can mobilize all these people that now have seen how you know the impact on them and 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 sort of the difference between what how they were able to respond and how other people have responded and sort of making this you know, making some structural changes going forward and thinking about you know, especially how how we can make this a just transition and not just the transition. Um, I think, you know, depending on where in the world you live, it's also shown that governments all of a sudden have been pretty willing to hand out cash to people. Um, and so if that can set a precedent, then we can really think about transitions as something where there are winners and losers and we need to take some money from the winners and give it to the losers so that we can kind of all get behind this transition. Um, that's a practice that would also help make this politically palatable going forward, right? So let's not just sort of ban coal, let's figure out what to do with the people who work in coal and give them money and training so that they can have a good life, even under a, sort of an energy transition. And so maybe we've sort of set a bit of a precedent because kind of, you know, just checks being sent to people and sort of, you know, just transition funds being set up and so on. Um, I don't think we've really seen that in quite that way in, in a long time, maybe in 2009, but I don't think quite as extreme even then. And so, you know, maybe there's some sort of lessons for inequality um, combating tools that we can take from this particular situation where we've had all these different things overlap. Yeah. 
I, I sort of thought that was really interesting. And do you have an idea about what's your thought about 100% employee and things? Perhaps we will not kind of return to that. You know, perhaps we are going to all have, or have jobs or, I mean, do you think society can work in that way? What do you mean? Just sort of like a, a universal basic income or yeah, something like that? Yes, that sort of thing. I mean, you know, that's a whole different debate and we can probably spend, you know, days debating that in, in particular. But I think it certainly shows that, you know, to make something sustainable, you have to redistribute income um, to the people and not just income, but also training and access and, and sort of tools to build a new life um, when we make structural changes to how we live and how we how we make money. And I think, and this, this actually goes to, and we're gonna shift to some of the questions from the audience and, and one audience member put it even sort of very, very succinctly that, you know, the Oxfam report that just came out showed that, you know, the richest 10% are of uh, the global population are responsible for 52% of the emissions. And this sort of inequality that has been increasing over year, over the years, had this dual effect on both the COVID crisis and an ongoing effect on the climate crisis. And I, I, actually, I mean, the inequality of, of, the, of the COVID crisis is an, is an absolute tragedy, but I'm wondering if it has made the existence of this inequality less palatable. And if the, any, if the existence of this level of inequality is less palatable, then it becomes, uh, a rallying cry and, and frankly just decreasing inequality might be the best climate policy we could come up with in, in some ways. Yeah. I, I, would, I, sorry. I certainly hope that that we realize that it that inequality is an important part of the problem. I think there are definitely like decreasing inequality won't change the underlying systems and when I think about this this is a systems problem. We have systems that are set up to work in such a way that is just unsustainable now. But I do think that addressing the inequality problems helps. And I think it's something that doesn't get enough attention and I'm happy to see it getting more political attention and talking about what a just transition means. I mean, when I saw politicians um, talk to people in coal areas, because coal is really declining in the United States and has been for a while, I'm happy to see them addressing those people. But when the promise was we're going to bring back coal, like they were selling them a, a bill of goods and those people deserve better. And so I'm hoping that we've learned from that mistake and will promise something better. Like we know, we know this is going to impact you. We recognize that and we care. Um, other, if you can't do that, you won't get the political will to move. We have this, you know, in the U.S. where I live, there's been this sort of, you know, a lot of conversation, at least initially, about frontline workers, right? Sort of people who keep the system running even during an emergency. Um, most of the people who were still working at the supermarket were, you know, minority communities essentially who keep these cities fed and 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 pick up the trash and you know all of the even at the emergency room getting my first COVID test. So. Um, we also have frontline workers for climate change. I mean, we can have a heat emergency, we can have hurricanes, some people need to still go to work. And so while some of us can stay at home with, you know, hurricane proof windows and a generator and a good internet connection, and hopefully still do our job. There are lots of people that need to move around for that to be sustainable. And so, you know, there are some concepts, I think, that we can borrow from this particular period and hopefully mobilize politically around, um, because we also need to make sure we have frontline workers for, for climate change and then sort of adapting to this new, um, this new reality, especially as we're not catching up to the, the goals that we've set, of our, set for ourselves and, and sort of containing the damage, right? Yeah, and I was just going to comment that that Citizens Assembly report I referred to in my discussion, it was interesting that uh, the majority of the things they proposed did all address both inequality and climate. Like their top recommendation was a frequent flyer 
act of some kind. So, 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 so I think there is a appetite for absolutely trying to address both inequality and climate change together. All right, so we're going to move. We have a couple of questions from the audience on investment, and so I'm going to I'm going to combine them two, and then then let you all let you all have at it. Um, so first, uh, I agree that the underlying energy system is one of the most important structures to change. Do you think that by tracking investment and its relationship with domestic politics, is it possible to understand how capital promotes clean energy? The energy system is not only determined by technology, also shaped by political economy. Um, and I, I think that that ties, that ties into all three of your, your component or all three of your presentations. But I think, and an, another question from the audience was about whether we're seeing investment shift, investment strategy shift within fossil fuel companies, sort of within the energy system, um, or are we seeing shifts in the general movement of capital between the fossil energy system and renewable energy, right? And, and I think that this also, just to throw in a little bit of my own sort of editorializing, this also has implications for just transition as well. Because one of the things we know is that capital can move very quickly and it actually doesn't care if people are hurt by those movements. And so where, what is, what, what are the financial aspects of disrupting carbon lock-in that are happening right now in, from these questions from the audience? Samantha, do you want to start off on that one? Sure, I'll say a few words. Um, I think one of the most interesting things that we have seen with respect to changing the underlying energy system, which is, which is kind of where, where I focus my research, so I, I keep coming back to that but is the incredible reductions in costs that we have seen in renewable technology. Um, Piers put up some, some figures that demonstrated that. And so what has happened there is that you're seeing investments in these technologies because they're economic. People are making money building these resources. Um, something I tell people and some people wave their hands at me and then some people think I'm really crass. But the truth is, is that when people can make money fixing this problem, you won't be able to stop them doing it. And so one of the things that the Chinese did for us that was extremely helpful that Jonas brought up is that they brought down these costs for us with um, inexpensive manufacturing economies of scale. And so they have attracted a ton of investment to renewables and that has been very good for the world's energy systems. Um, and so you'll see pressure on banks to invest in things. You'll see pressure on businesses to change their business practices. And they'll do this in response to pressure. But I mean, ultimately, businesses do what businesses do, and they're in the business of making money. And so what helps is when the costs of these technologies come down, either because they came down organically or because policy changed the relative costs of different technologies. And that's the role that technology can play. But we need to think about both improving and reducing costs of technologies and in using policy to change the relative positions of these technologies. Um, that's when people can make money making these investments and then you can't stop them. So those are the two levers that I think where the political economy and how capital moves, we need to mobilize a ton of capital, way more than governments can put into this. And the way to do that is to shape the playing field to make that the, um, the economically advantageous thing to do. Yeah, perhaps uh, I can address it from a slightly different perspective and address some of the other things that came up in the questions and and it's about we have been successful at decarbonizing our energy supply but, but the very next thing we have to do in that kind of journey we have to decarbonize our buildings and our whole systems of transportation uh, and that does, that does 
require much more investment within our urban infrastructures uh, and building fitting and uh, thinking about the way we can redesign our environments and that is particularly in, in, important concurrently because I think it would wait up one can chat that we could potentially see people go back to living in suburbia and unless we design our suburban environment correctly or we don't have to go into work all the time we we'll probably get it incorrect so, so I think there's a big opportunity with this to either either trans transform the way we live and work perhaps or alternatively alternatively we need to get it we might get it completely incorrect but it, it does make a challenge for the in assessments because they they are big kind of billion all the investments now you have to do lots of little things you have to transform your urban con con jungles and your transportation so it 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 does require intelligent intelligent way to involve the community and to to try and build those investments together um, I would sort of say two things and sort of take it in a slightly different direction, but maybe build on what Samantha just said. I think um, in terms of sort of financing and investments, there were, I think there's sort of two interesting opportunities here. One is that the sort of lockdown and the sort of rapid drop in oil demand and then these problems with oil futures and all sorts of stuff that led the oil price to go negative really showed for the first time that the oil industry can have a demand problem. I think we always thought about this as a supply problem and we never really considered the fact that these guys could go bust because they've made long term, um, you know, sort of strategies around the fact that we will always keep buying more oil. And I think that's really changing the behavior of pension funds of sort of sovereign wealth investors that are um, you know, have for a long time now debated whether they should divest, but I think it really gave this whole you know, movement a push because it showed that not only is it a bad investment for the planet, it can also be a bad investment um, for, for your investment portfolio if you don't get the timing right and sort of the abrupt nature of all of this, I think really disrupted thinking about the oil industry as a sort of investment target. Um, on the sort of financing side, I, I'm hoping that what we'll see out of these stimulus packages and sort of the recovery is more um, more sort of infrastructure financing, kind of clean climate banks, you know, essentially sort of, you know, state banks that will, will do some of that financing for us. And as Samantha said, I don't think, it, you know, it's not going to be enough, but it might be something that could help us address some of these inequalities, finance projects, for instance, in small businesses that otherwise couldn't sort of switch to cleaner sources, that we can sort of capitalize some financial institutions in this current um, in this current situation that we otherwise didn't have. And I also think that there is a real problem of financing this transition in developing economies where China is currently the only player in town with the Belt and Road Initiative that doesn't really have a climate objective, but it's, it's China saying it's agnostic. So if you are Vietnam and you wanna buy energy and you want a coal power plant, they'll sell you a coal power plant and provide financing. If, they'll sell, if you want solar, they'll do that too. But on average, this hasn't been a very good strategy for climate. And so one way to shift China and nudge them towards more um, carbon friendly investment would be if Europe and the United States got together and set on some sort of financing vehicle that be, could be an alternative to the only game in town right now. And so I think, again, that's not going to be enough to fix the whole problem. But we are sort of identifying now where the gaps are in all of this. And, and I think that sort of state capitalized financing institutions sort of national infrastructure banks and so on can provide some of these solutions all right so now i have a question that's going to take that follows from this but takes things in a, in a potentially very different direction um curious what the panelists think about whether disrupting carbon lock-in requires disrupting growth lock-in in other words our obsession with perpetual economic growth specifically in the overdeveloped global north. 
degrowth advocates critique green stimulus and green new deal proponents for not addressing this enough and and we just had a conversation about investment and and sort of making money on 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 the green transition but do we have to break the growth lock in as well Jonas you want to start on that Sure, why not? I, uh, I don't have a good response to that, I guess, but I sort of, you know, off the cuff, let me um, try to respond nonetheless. Um, I think that the degrowth uh, sort of movement is, from my perspective, not a very politically uh, sellable strategy. I think it's going to be really hard to get people broadly on board with that, um, with that sort of mindset. I do think that we haven't really figured out the growth problem because sort of from the Green New Deal perspective, the only way, way we've been sort of selling growth as a result of investments and, and kind of climate strategies has been to basically pretend that in this new future of a clean economy, everyone can work in a solar fan, fan factory, right? Like, I mean, we have sort of talked about it as if there's jobs just concretely tied to these very activities that can, can somehow sustain entire economies. And I think, both of those perspectives are, are kind of problematic. Um, the reason why we um, got huge productivity gains after the IT revolution wasn't because we all started working in computer factories, right? We had huge productivity gains because it made us more efficient and more productive and, and sort of changed the way the economy works. And so I think from a growth perspective, what we need to think about and work out is how we can use uh, cheaper, cleaner energy uh, better, more equitably. Um, to kind of change the way that we conduct you know, economic activities. I think that there are lots of opportunities to do that. We have zero marginal cost for renewable energy. We don't have that for any other fuel, basically. So there are ways that this can kind of bolster growth and, and kind of economic behavior, but I don't think we've quite found the answer. What certainly isn't the answer is sort of this mindless growth model where we're also encouraging more consumption and you know, more air travel. So I think, it's, it, I think it needs to be more nuanced, but we don't need to, uh, put the cap on all types of growth and sort of just decide, you know, today is enough. We should probably at least cut out those flights to nowhere that are taking place in Australia right now, right? Where yeah, that was pretty mind boggling, right? I wanted Australia and landed back in the same place. Yeah, I saw those as well. I'll add a couple of things. We, we need to think about decoupling economic growth from extraction. Um, a lot of what we have done, not just in terms of energy, although that's what I spend all day thinking about, but other ways as well, has been focused on extraction of natural resources, of energy resources. And I don't think we necessarily need to let go of the idea of economic growth, but we do need, need to think about, about how to get out of the extraction business. And the way I describe this in turn and work that I've done in terms of energy transitions is you think back to the good old days, which weren't necessarily all that good, but we relied on incoming sun pretty much on a real time basis um, through photosynthesis and through, you know, the work of humans and animals. And so we were basically symbiotic with the sun and we didn't get out of that until we started extracting fossil fuels and using stored sun. And from an energy perspective, we need to get back to that symbiosis with the sun. And lucky for us, there is plenty of solar insulation to cover the amount of energy that we now use. And we're, we have much more efficient ways of capturing it than just through you know, photosynthesis and burning plants. And so that is, at least in this area, a way where you can decouple, at least for the most part, growth from extraction. You still need, the, you still need to make the, the objects that make that kind of energy happen. But there may be other ways as well where we can decouple somewhat. Maybe not completely get out of the extraction business, but at least move towards much less extraction with respect to economic growth. If we can't do that, then this becomes a really deep philosophical problem. At some point we reach the carrying capacity of the earth and that's challenging. Um, but at least in the, in the field that I work in and the things I think about, I really do think about, okay, can we get back in sun balance? Because that's what a sustainable energy system at its core really is. Yeah, in fact, I do think we, we do have to begin to, to think about these sort of things in fact, because we are going to, well, probably where we see declines in population, so we are going to have to think about the way our economy works and how we get our sense of, can, 
worth and things when we go forward. And the other thing you can do, you can try and bring in far mental con con costs more effectively into the economies. So, so therefore it becomes more integral to the to the way your economy works. So I, th I think there are alternatives and I think we ought to consider them, but I do think it's just a, yeah, you, 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 you discussed. It, it isn't probably politically advisable to bring them together because I think what I want to see for this, you get good cross party, cross bench support. So you get Democrats and Republicans together because I think the more you can get consistent policies from one parliament to the next one, the more of the more effective you will be at getting to your net zero target. Can I make one more quick point on this or are we of course? Um, just to build, you know, Samantha articulated this so much better than I ever could, but I, I just wanted to add to that that, you know, we're also not equally out of whack with the sort of sun in different parts of the world. And so if we think about no growth, that means very different things in different parts of the world, right? And so, you know, maybe at, in the US and Canada and, and Northern Europe, no growth is a pretty good quality of life right now, right? But there are lots of places that have much lower carbon emissions per capita than we do. And to sort of then have a no growth debate on top of that is, you know, is hugely unfair in many ways. And that's exactly what often comes up at these international climate conferences. So, um, you know, I think for, for the rich economies to think more about a circular economy and how they can kind of um, move away from, you know, burning more oil to get more growth is, you know, hugely important. But I think it's a much more complicated discussion to have with places like India that are, you know, building a middle class that can for the first time afford air conditioning is also hugely impacted by heat waves now and climate change. And so how do you deal with growth in that context, right? These people also deserve to live and sleep well and have, you know, a comfortable work day. Um, and so I think the no growth debate is just sort of difficult to have at the global level because the, con the context for us is so different in, in different parts of the world. Uh, yeah, I'll just add an amen to that. Any solution to the climate problem that doesn't lift the billion people in the world who don't have access to modern energy services, that's not a solution. We, those people deserve better. And this, this no growth argument is very much a first world argument. I, I completely agree with you, 100%. So this is actually a perfect segue because a couple of questions from the audience are asking very much about the, this north-south dimension of disrupting carbon lock-in and the pandemic. And uh, I think we're going to ask you to uh, elaborate a little on what you, what you all just said there. Um, and so three, three questions that I'll sort of put together. Um, first, I guess this one's more for, for peers. What kind of you you showed the one map with the different regional um, uh, with the regional differences, but I wonder if you could elaborate a little more on the regional differences and the north south differences that you're seeing in emissions uh, reductions in from the paper. Um, and then someone uh, interested uh, said for my doctoral thesis, I'm interested in how transition to clean energy can be possible in the Latin American region. How can the global south participate? And make a difference. This isn't, uh, as as you just mentioned, this isn't just a global north, and it's not even just a sort of a China-U.S. axis. There's there's a, there's a multiple dimensions to the north-south relations. And and someone, one other audience member, put it very bluntly: Hasn't inequality always been at the heart of the climate debate in terms of the north-south? And and isn't this the reason for the polarized positions on addressing climate change? And will and how do we move forward from that in this disrupting carbon lock-in? And I'll just add to that one, does the context of the pandemic change that relationship at all? A lot on the table for you. So Piers, why don't you start off and, and I'll let you all address any aspects of those that, you, that you'd like. Yeah, it's a very interesting discussion point because I would want to know the 
answer because it was the thing about my work that I found most surprising. If you if you look at the country, the top ten or the top twenty countries, they saw the biggest changes. They were from every sort of income bracket in every kind of continent and that you saw big changes in countries like Bolivia but also in parts of Africa and in the Middle East and Asia as, as, as well as some rich and wealthy countries. So, so I did find that quite, quite extraordinary that all the different countries we we would think would behave very differently. They all seem to do exactly the same. Uh, 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 and perhaps my data is not very good because I can't believe they really did. And the thing that would make me a bit worried about my own data is that it would it would it would based on Google data. So it must have only been tracking people with Android kind of telephones. So perhaps my own data wasn't really reflective of what was happening in different countries. So perhaps my data only only serves a certain cross section of society behave the same across the globe. I have a couple of things to say, and I think I'll start with the underlying question about the global south first. I really believe that one of the greatest underlying challenges in dealing with the carbon problem is the developed versus the developing world, the global north versus the global south. And it all comes down to arguments that are perfectly accurate, but fundamentally don't help us fix the problem. And that is the developing world saying, hey, developed world, you caused this problem, y'all can fix it. This, this is your problem, make it happen. How dare you come to us and tell us not to develop the way you did. But on the other hand, this problem cannot be fixed without participation from the developing world. They cannot develop the way that we did. We don't have the carbon budget for that. And additionally, energy demand in the developed world, the OECD world more or less, is basically flat. The only place we're seeing energy demand growing is in the developing world. And so that's where the action's at. And so we absolutely have to work together or we cannot deal with this problem. And so, I mean, that's somewhat what, what we tried to do with the Paris Agreement, with this bring your own goals structure. Um, it has its own problems, but at least got, got everybody on board because it recognizes that we all need to be on board if we're ever gonna get anywhere. But we have to find ways to help the developing world. We have to recognize that, yep, rich people did solve the problem and we have to help with the solution and we need to somehow bring this problem together. But it's super thorny. And part of the reason why it is, is that everybody's right in what they're saying, but ultimately it doesn't matter because we can't fix the problem if we act that way. Um, just really briefly on Latin America, um, I think the opportunities for decarbonization in Latin America are fantastic. Um, Latin America has fabulous renewable resources. And when you think about deep decarbonization, the general formula is decarbonize the electricity sector and then electrify everything you can. That's like the, the, the base formula. And then you work around the edges for things you can electrify. But um, Latin America has, ter has terrific hydro resources. It has great wind and solar. So the hydro makes a good backup for the wind and solar. Um, the, the opportunities are fantastic. You've seen some of the lowest solar bids in the world happen here in Mexico. I mean, this is, the, the opportunities are fabulous. Um, you need to attract investment and you need to put in place policies that bring that investment in. But um, I actually think it's a, it's a very positive part of the world for decarbonization because the resources are so good. Um, maybe just a few points. I think, um, you know, one of the things about sort of development and, and climate is that so much of it depends when particular regions developed, right? So Europe developed at a time when we didn't have individual cars. So cities are naturally much more set up for public transit than in North America, where sort of the, the big push of development happened at a time when you had individual transport. And then in the US, when air conditioning became cheap, right? That's when the West really and the Southwest really became sort of big centers of population. 
And so in some ways, there's also an opportunity for developing economies now to do things differently. And it doesn't mean less growth. It just means you invest in different kinds of things. And so I think the politics around this will be very different because you don't have to sort of move away an, an existing system that is fully functional, supplies all the energy that everybody needs and has huge you know, financial backers. That's sort of our problem in the West. Um, and, and if you think about sort of developing economies that are growing rapidly now and that are sort of, you know, discovering energy, rapidly rising energy demand, the key is to sort of figure out ways that we can push it in the right direction. In some ways, it's much easier than to be part of this um, clean future because you never really kind of invested in the other stuff in the first place or not to the same degree. Um, some of my colleagues at Hopkins have done a lot of work on India and, and energy demand in India. And, um, you know, part of the problem with energy is that once it's almost like a gateway drug. So they did all these studies on giving people solar chargers for their phones, and then people wanted chargers that would also power their um, radios, and then they wanted a microwave. And so, like, you know, it's sort of one thing, once you're connected, you want um, all of the things that you can do with electricity. And I think that's completely reasonable. So the key is sort of how do you then, once you start from the beginning, don't you know, give them solar chargers and then kind of build out the system with coal power plants after that as people want more power. So, and that's you know, something that um, where developing economies can you know, make a lot of money building out that system, but we need to help them also get, get the investment and the technology and so on. Most of it is there, the expertise is also there. Um, I don't actually think it's such a complicated problem, um, but it's certainly one where we have to make the right decisions at the right time. And so um, if the US developed sort of in the car era, Europe in the kind of course and subway public transit train era, then maybe some, some of the global South can now develop in the kind of clean energy era and avoid many of the mistakes that we've made. So a last, uh, a last set of questions. Um, That's right, wait, wait, wait. Oh. No, I want to say that that yeah. does sound quite optimistic, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> A, a last set of questions is actually going to take us to thinking about cities. We've been talking a lot on the sort of global and national scale, but each one of your presentations did touch on, on cities and the urban scale as well. And so one of the, I'll just read out the questions and then uh, again, let you, you pick up on parts of it that, that you want. First one said, um, uh, and this was specifically to Dr. De Forster, um, in your research, do you consider the behavior of other actors at the subnational level, such as cities or city networks, and their role in cooperating to adopt clean energy and, and the emissions reductions? And then another one, I'm curious about the panelists' thoughts about ongoing impacts on the desirability of cities, because we have, as Jonas mentioned, um, there has been some discussion of flight from cities. And corresponding shifts on energy systems and or behavior. Is this an opportunity or a setback? Could we see shifts toward more fossil fuel consumption because of movements to suburbs and increased car culture? And what capacities would governments need to decarbonize mid-sized cities? So a lot on the table there. I'll let you choose something. And then I'm going to, after we answer this round of questions, I'm going to give you each a 30-second uh, send-off for, for, for our audience. I'm happy to jump in. I have sure, sort of two points about cities. Um, one, I think, uh, you know, that if cities were become were to become less desirable, that would be a problem for emissions. One of the key reasons, you know, why urban populations had lower carbon emissions in the past was because of the density and the sort of possibility supported by the density. And I can certainly see that New York City isn't an attractive place to move after watching what they went through um, over the last couple of months. The, the problem is that, uh, you know, moving to the suburbs, even if you work from home, has huge uh, kind of climate implications. You'll still end up driving to the supermarket, even if you don't have to drive to work. There's huge costs in terms of land and, and, and you know, all sort of the, the byproducts of essential sprawl. Um, and so I think there is a big role to be played for governments to continue to work on that and prevent that. I mean, in Europe, you know, 15 years ago, there was a lot of conversations about the sort of climate impact of different kinds of zoning and preventing exactly the kind of sprawl. And so um, I think we need to be very conscious of, of what these shifts would do. In terms of what cities can do, I think um, 
you know, in the US, there's been a lot of debate since the beginning of the Trump administration to what extent cities can sort of step up in the absence of a federal government that is really kind of concerned about climate. And the capabilities of cities are, are hugely varied and not everyone can participate in quite the same way. Cities also have very different resources available to them. Some places have a municipal power company and so they can make decisions actually about fuel sources. Other places don't, right? In New York City, the transit system belongs to the state government. It's not a municipal transit system, so they can't make any decisions about that. So I think we have to be very nuanced there and I don't think there is a blanket answer in terms of um, sort of their ability to step up because the circumstances vary so much and we have very strong municipal authorities with a lot of tools available and then we have places like Toronto that are in many ways sort of forged together at some point and and, and a lot less able to do things and rely on the uh, provincial government much more. can step in. I would just add that at least in the U.S. federal system, states and localities, there are things that they can specifically do that are um, part of their jurisdiction. Um, a really important one, and um, I believe it was Pierce who was talking a bit about buildings. Um, building codes are local in the United States, and not every um, city has the capacity, in fact, very few do, to come up with their own green building codes. But there are example green building codes. And there are things that they can do through their jurisdiction over zoning and how buildings are built to really help their cities become greener, not just in the building stock itself, but also in how things are cited. Are you making cities walkable? Are you making there's sort of this new urbanism idea that walkable neighborhoods that have neighborhood restaurants and grocery stores and the kind of services that you need very nearby have become more desirable. And so there's a lot that cities can do with zoning. Um, also, a lot of things with respect to the power system, at least in the states, are at the um, state jurisdiction level. And so you things, let's see things like renewable portfolio standards requiring a certain amount of renewables and other things. And those can happen at the state level. And we've even seen those grow under the Trump administration for the past four years, because states have realized, well, if the federal government isn't gonna do anything, what can we do? And so they've looked at things that are within their jurisdiction and, and pushed on those. You don't have a federal floor, and that's unfortunate. There will be states and cities and jurisdictions that won't do anything under those circumstances. But those who care, um, there are certain things under their, their jurisdictions that can make a big difference, and building and zoning is a really important one. Yeah, I would completely, uh, completely agree with what the other two discussed. I, I would just say one extra thing, and that is I think we do, we do have to try and try and get them to have one jurisdiction in some way as much as we possibly can do. So we have to in, try and encourage, as Samantha talked about it several times, this systems approach to transforming our society. So we have to think about exactly where people will be working and what can transportation system they have and what energy supplies and what they're going to heat and things so we have to think about it collectively so that is really kind of kind of why i think we must try as much as possible to 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 get them to kind of coordinate excellent so to to finish off i thought i would give each of you 30 seconds to a minute to to to, to send off your your final thoughts um, and why don't we go in uh, reverse order to your presentations? And so hopefully we'll end up feeling better because Jonas will go first and then we'll, we'll get more optimistic as, as we go. So Jonas. Well, thank you all for sort of a great conversation about, about this topic. And I'm, you know, I apologize that I started on such a pessimistic note. <laughs> I think I'm actually not as pessimistic as, um, as you might think, I think we just need to be very careful about what we attribute to the crisis and what we still need to do. And so I think if we frame this recession as a sort of silver bullet that somehow, um, you know, we reduce carbon emissions in 2020, there'll be recovery packages that allow us to decarbonize sustainably in the, in the future. Um, and, you know, we're going to bring manufacturing back and it'll create all these jobs. I think I'm very pessimistic that all of those things will happen in a way that will help us face the climate crisis. I don't think we have broken the lock-in just by uh, going through this uh, crazy year. 
I hope that in some ways it's motivated us to take this seriously, that, you know, we need to believe in science, that climate change is real, that, you know, it's nice if you can see the Rocky Mountains, and that actually we have a lot of the tools available to us to get going on this climate problem so that we don't have, uh, you know, similar disruptive events in the future. It's just that relying on this pandemic and the recession that followed for all of the solutions is really not going to help us very far. Thank you. Samantha? Yeah, I'll jump in just with the overall point that pain is very politically unpopular. And so we can come in and, and point out the kinds of emissions reductions that we saw. But we have to be really careful that we don't set something up where the public connects emissions reductions with pain, because that is that, that is not going to help us move the needle on this. I think it is helpful to point out some of the good things, seeing the Rocky Mountains, um, the, the air and water quality improvements and say, you know, this has shown that we can do this, but we have to be really careful not to connect it with having to go back to pain or having to kill the economy in order to make this happen because that, that is just not a politically viable approach. And ultimately these are political problems. If we can't get the politics right, then the technology barely matters. And so we need to be very careful how we use this thing that happened and we use it well and not poorly. I, I, that's, that's actually, I often tell my students in climate politics classes that global recessions are, are probably the most expensive way to do climate policy. <laughs> Piers. Um, okay, I'm going to say, I think, I had two things to say, but I'm going to say one. I, I would say that the, the, soon the president of China, Jinping did come out and he declared a net zero climate target for the first time. So, so, so perhaps he's got some of our optimism. So, so on that note, I think I'm now going to harp on that night and going to get myself a glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it'd be very interesting. So thank you very much. Well, I, I really want to thank all of you for, for your time and for your insights. This has been a, a really excellent conversation, and I think we all got quite a bit out of it. Um, one thing that is less fun about Zoom uh, meetings than in person is that we can't all have a glass of wine or a beer together and continue the conversation in, in more informal ways. Um, that said, that we, we are working on trying to figure out ways to continue the conversation digitally, and we'll be in touch with everybody that registered for this, and then you all panelists, if, if you want, and, and uh, certainly want to encourage everybody to join us for the next two webinars on October 21st and November 17th. Um, information on panelists will be forthcoming on that uh, very quickly, and to, to keep an eye out for our symposium uh, next spring. But this is all we're going to do for today. Um, we heard a lot about some of the great possibilities and obstacles for breaking through carbon lock-in um, from the pandemic or just from in general. And I think that we all took away quite a bit, or I certainly did, took away quite a bit to, to think about moving forward. And, and I have to say, I've, I came into this feeling pretty dark, and I'm leaving feeling a little less dark. And so uh, that's just on a personal level, that's, that, feels, that feels pretty good. But with that, uh, I wish everybody a safe, uh, safe couple of months here, and uh, have a great evening. And, and thank you again to the panelists, and uh, we'll see you all hopefully on October 21st.